on the third option, if later on we're given permission, they have to be used. Um, Do a joint meeting every summer. Um, so this is our, our delayed summer meeting, but I think that in a way it's back into the swing of things it helps uh, boost the return. Yep. Okay. Thank you Thank and, and we're happy to host. Uh, this is our first time hosting, so we hope we get out of the park, right? <laughs> so before we get started, I want to we're really excited to have our speaker here. He uh, has been a, a pillar within the ENCOSI community from system engineering, model based to unified architecture framework. Uh, he, he's done a lot of work in a lot of different industries. And um, but tonight, the topic is you know, certainly we're getting close to uh, what they're saying about El Nino next year, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, let's keep this as a prepared moment here. Uh, I'd like to welcome Matthew House. Welcome to the stage. Okay. Should I share my slides yes. over Zoom? <coughs> okay. I will stop sharing. It will say, uh, okay. I forgot on most of these. You have to click share three times. I really do want to share. No, 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 please no. share. Mm -hmm. Not good to say. <clears throat> We're all good globally and everywhere. Okay. No echo or anything? All right. My name is Matthew Hawes, and uh, I started my career here in Houston, in fact, at Houston Lighting and Power, as it used to be called then. I think it's now called Reliant. This was back in 1977, sort of gives you an idea of how old I am. And I originally started working in transmission construction, which was looking at the planning and the construction of the actual transmission towers. And uh, if you've ever been up in a transmission tower, they are noisy as can be. You, you don't realize it, but they're just chattering and singing and all sorts of stuff going on. Then I switched to distribution. So my job, I had the area that was west of uh, the 610 loop and all the way to what would have been Highway 6 back then and south of uh, I-10. And so my job was to drive around the different companies and they'd say, we're going to add this or we're going to build this or we're going to put in a completely new subsystem or, yeah, sorry, a, a subdivision. My job was to help them do this, figure out where does the electricity go to inspection. My final job at the light company was transmission planning. And what we did at Transmission Planning is we looked at the entire Texas energy grid and we said, what energy needs are we going to have in 20 years? So we did what was called load flows, where what you do is you look at various uh, flows of the electricity through there based on generation profiles, number of other things, and you see, okay, based on this configuration or this one, are we going to have sufficient to actually meet the demand? So I'm very familiar with the Texas energy grid. In fact, the other day I was driving by uh, Jewett, Texas, which is not a big place. But I knew of it because it's got an enormous power plant out there. So I got to know Texas and its grid very well. Another element, oh, and back then, my God, did we have extra capacity. Not so much of these days. But the other thing is, just for reference, does everybody, anybody know how many major grids of electricity there are in the U.S.? There are three, the East Coast, the West Coast, and Texas. Mm -hmm. 
And the rule was, if you kept everything within Texas, you didn't have to worry about the Interstate Commerce Commission. And if anybody got the bright idea of, well, no, I'd like to be connected externally, everyone would open their circuit breakers and wish you luck. So <clears throat> more on this in a little bit to talk about these aspects. So I worked in the power industry, so I lived overseas for 25 years. And for 12 of those, I worked at Westinghouse doing energy management systems, which is basically the control system. And you have things like automatic generation control, live load flow, uh, simulation systems where you'd say, gee, I wonder what happens if I open or close the circuit breaker. Um, and then you'd find out and then you'd go, okay, that's not a good idea. But yeah, it was fascinating stuff. So power systems is something I know something about. And commission systems all over the world as well. And then I got into model-based systems and software engineering, and then eventually enterprise architecture. And you know what industry? No one is interested in model-based systems engineering? Power systems. So when this happened, I was living in Austin during 2021. I moved back here. And my wife and I uh, were tromping around in the two feet of snow that we had in our front yard. <laughs> And most of Texas, if you recall, was out of power. And I was thinking about why in the world did this happen? So I sat down and thought about it and read some of the accounts. And the first thing I thought of was it was lack of incentive. Now, as I'm going through this, I'll explain exactly what it is I'm talking about. And the other day I was listening to a, an NPR podcast on this because it was uh, talking about the energy grid, and one of the first things someone said at the beginning was, it really was down to lack of incentive. So I thought, well, I must be on to something here. So why is it called tilting at windmill? Anybody want to take a stab? Don Quixote reference, and everybody saying it was all the windmill's fault. And as it says in my abstract, uh, it was and it wasn't. And in fact, there's a lot of things that were and weren't the cause of this. So I, I thought it was a great title. And in fact, my uh, co-writer, my co-author, Lars Olaf Hustrom, sent me this picture of a frozen Swedish windmill. We'll show you another frozen Swedish windmill in a moment. So again, more Don Quixote there. It's one of the original woodcuts from the uh, book. So we'll look at what did and didn't happen. Uh, the concept of incentives, does anybody know about system of systems and some of their characteristics? Tony does, yeah. We'll look at some of these aspects as well, why they're more difficult. We'll also look at the difference between an enterprise and a system, uh, some future research, and some conclusions. So let's look at the facts. Winter storm Uri hit Texas. And we had freezing temperatures, but unlike normal, as you all know, the temperature stayed, went down below zero and never went above zero, zero for four days. In fact, when I moved here from Minnesota uh, back in 1977, there was a famous <coughs> Texas sheriff who was talking about the problems with too many Yankees moving down mm -hmm. south. And he said, Yankees are a lot like hemorrhoids. When they come down and go back up, they're fine. It's when they come down and stay down that they're a pain in the you know what. <laughs> and it, it's kind of like that with the temperature. If it stays down, then you're in trouble. And that's what happened. So as a result, all the generation, the gas that powers it, the transport of coal, and the nuclear, which uses water, everything failed because it is a complex system of systems, and we'll look at that. The loss of generation put the grid stability at risk, because grid stability, if you've ever done anything in this area, really is, it can be a sensitive thing. And you've got to look at lots of multiple systems working at once. I do a lot of work at, with systems of systems, and since my very first job was take a system the size of Texas, and say, what happens if I change this tiny bit thing here? I'm sure it won't cause any trouble. And then the whole thing just collapses on and you think, okay, small changes can have big uh, impacts. 
So anyways, they load shed to protect the grid. Originally, they were going to have rolling blackouts, and they cut off the first section and then said, oh, dear, we're out of power. So a lot of the people that got turned off never came back again until mm -hmm. we unfroze. 300 people died. It was four days. Texas was not prepared. So let's look at some myths. Here, here was one of the famous ones. Everybody remembers seeing this picture. And effectively, it said, uh, we have here a wind turbine, and they're spraying a uh, de-icer on this to uh, de-ice the uh, uh, wind turbine. The problem with this is that this was the frozen windmill in Sweden I was telling you about. And in fact, they were spraying water on it to get it to freeze to see if their natural defrosting actually worked. Because one of the myths is it's like it was all the you know, fossil fuels fault for not having de-iceable uh, power systems. Well, what do you think they do in Sweden? They have power systems that actually keep them from icing over. Why don't we use them here? It's not worth the money. We only have these power outages every 40 years, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So as a result, as I say, if you go to your boss and say, boss, we need to winterize all our systems here, because even though this only happens every 40 years and we hardly lose any money on it, it's for the good of the state of Texas in power. You will be looking for a job very quickly afterwards. And that's the problem. So the people who bought the windmill did not winterize them either. Now the renewables, anybody have any idea of how much renewables there are in Texas? Yeah, on a regular basis, it's like 20%. And a normal time, it could rise as high as 40%, and I think there was one day that it actually covered all of the demand of the entire state. That is to say, it rose high enough to do this. You've always got reserve on top of that. But the point is, we have a lot of renewables. So, because they went out and we were relying on them, this caused us some problems. The problem was, so did everything else. So it wasn't just the windmills, although they played their part. The other thing is, again, we have our three grids. After the energy thing occurred, El Paso was very smug, and they said, we were connected to the West grid, and we didn't lose power. Gee, aren't we smart? Remember the following year? We had the other freeze? Yeah. They lost power, and they were in the dark and frozen for about two days. So why is it not necessarily a good idea to connect to the rest of it? Well, there was an IEEE, there's references at the back, I've got like two pages worth of references, and they found the larger your grid, the more likely you are to have a catastrophic failure. It seems counterintuitive, but it really is. Bigger is not better. Bigger actually can cause you to fail more and to fail more catastrophically. In Texas, we have a fairly stable grid. It usually takes a hurricane to knock us off, but in this case, it was just bad planning. So we are very stable, uh, so again, that was another thing. Uh, I think in the list of 50 different states, we're number eight, I believe, in stability and failure, et cetera. Uh, the failure was not foreseen. Oh, yes, it was foreseen. We were standing in the middle of the freeway and watching that truck come at us for two weeks and it didn't move because we knew this was going to be a problem and nobody did anything, partly because there wasn't much to be done because everybody knows the story of when is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. <laughs> When's the second best time? Today. It was one of those because it takes several months to do this stuff. Deregulation was a major cause. You know why we have all these solar powered things, the windmills, etc.? Deregulation. If you want to put up well, assuming your homeowners association, a windmill in the back of your house, you probably can, and you can connect it to the internet or to the grid, and they'll buy your electricity. Why? Deregulation. So it's what enabled all this stuff, but because the gas was deregulated, the electricity was de was deregulated, the prices kept coming up. And again, we'll see in a minute why this was also a problem. Okay, what really caused the failure? Everything froze. It wasn't just the, the uh, generation, it was 
the nuclear generators, wind turbines, solar, the gas generations, and all the supporting infrastructure, gas drilling, distribution, and most critically, water supply. What are the two types of major power that doesn't need water? Solar and wind. That's it. Everything else needs water. So as a result, when the water pipes froze, you had, might have had the gas, you might have had everything else you need, but you weren't going to generate any electricity. So again, complex system of system. My colleague who lives over near Bee Caves in Austin, he lived in an apartment and uh, it froze. And they turned off all the water to all the apartments. You know what they forgot? Fire sprinklers. So of course, when everything unfroze, the fire sprinkler water, which is of course above you, froze completely decimated his apartment, so he had to go live elsewhere for a six months. So they fixed everything. So nothing was winterized. Transportation wasn't winterized. Uh, I mean, I, as I said, I grew up in Minnesota. I know how to drive in snow and ice, but let me tell you, I wasn't driving in that. It was like an ice skating rink. So gas supplies froze, limiting gas generations. Houses neither gas. Further limiting supplies, prices rose which meant the gas generation closed down because the gas price got so high that it cost them 20 times more to generate the electricity than what they could get for it. So even though you had generators that could generate, financially they couldn't do it. And no one, the Texas government, for instance, is going to say, don't worry about it, we got the price covered. Because, again, everybody was caught off guard. Water supplies, as I said, demand exceeded supply. ERCOT said, uh, do load shedding, cut critical services. Power was cut off from millions of businesses. Now, bizarrely, our house got cut off. Remember, like a week before, there was a mini freeze? Yeah, we lost electricity for nine hours. But the big one, we had electricity the whole time. We did get a, a pipe froze, which meant I had to take cold showers for four or five days, but what the hell, at least we had power and heat. So why wasn't it winterized? Incentives, because it wasn't mandated, so we had no stick. Government wasn't putting any money up or providing rewards, so we had no carrot. So if someone says, I want you to spend a lot of money and do a lot of work, but you're not gonna get anything from it, if you're a business, you tell them to pound sand or whatever the correct thing is. So as a result, again, since it only happens 40 years, there was no business case, which is another of the lessons of this presentation, which is if you're doing engineering and you're not firmly fixed on the business case, as well as the engineering, you're going to fail. And as I said, this was university applied. I live in Minnesota. Everything there is winterized. It's 40 below zero. We are warm and happy in our houses. Why in the world would I build a Minnesota house in Texas? Yeah, for one, the, the air conditioning bills are going to be phenomenal. Um, and as I said, it just doesn't work. There's no point. So we have to look for the next thing at engineering and business. So anybody know the concept of system of systems? Hey, Tony knows. See, all the, all the Incozy guys are nodding their heads. Saying, we know all about this stuff. Okay. Mark Mayer from MITER came up with this definition. Collections of systems, each of them can operate together quite happily all by themselves, but they interoperate to achieve desired capabilities. And the point of these is, is you can have different types of systems. And there are five characteristics of a system of systems. You have operational independence, the gas versus the electricity versus the water systems, and even the independent municipalities and generation system. They're managed, geographical description. They all have emergent behavior. That is to say, when they come together, additional good and bad things happen. And evolutionary development processes. They all change over time, as well as the entire system of systems. Other aspects, multiple levels of stakeholders, and they have competing interests. The gas company wants to sell their gas for as high as possible. 
the electric company wants to buy it as cheaply as possible. I mean, could you have two more opposing goals? They have different priorities, different ways to escalate crises. Your crisis is not my crisis. Things change over life cycle. They have multiple owners making resource decisions. So I was liking this to, uh, I'm, I'm a choir director, and the way that you organize and manage a choir and inspire them is not the same thing as an army sergeant would use with new recruits. You're not going to get very far. So it's all about the cooperation and convincing that your goals are in fact the same. So if we look at the Texas grid, it's, it's fairly obvious that they have operational independence. Each of these are managed. Everyone knows about ERCOT now. They're infamous throughout the world. They're the ones that do the uh, system of systems regulation, but just for the electric part. Uh, they change over time again. The new generators are this. Uh, geographical just distribution, well, we're not even going to go into that one. They have life cycle independence. They change things as and when they feel they do and as and when their business case tells them they need to. Now, there's types of systems. So if you think about an air traffic management system, that wouldn't work very well if every part of that system decided it was going to do whatever it wanted to do and change without telling the others. So this is what's called a directive where the purpose of this is one single purpose, but you still do have these multiple systems, but they coordinate. You can have an acknowledge system where you have recognized objectives, it is managed to some extent, but the systems maintain their independence. And then you have collaborative here, where everybody works together voluntarily to fulfill central purposes, although they still have their own purpose. So, that's the energy grid. And virtual, which is the internet. You can also have systems of systems that just happen to come together. If you think of natural systems, parks, the ocean, it's these are as well. So again, if you take all these, and I've got all this in the slide so you can look at, uh, the different levels of stakeholders you have to negotiate it, no common good, different priorities, Okay, so what's the difference between a system and an enterprise? If for those systems engineers, you know that you, for a system you have inputs, you have outputs. With an enterprise, it's man-made. Group of people, or sometimes one person, decides we're gonna have an enterprise, this is its purpose, we're all gonna cooperate, and these are our goals. And you say, what is causing us to do things. So why was Encozy or ASME of any of these organizations, these enterprise created, for the common good of all the members? And you're going to have reasons why you would change. New technology might cause you to do things. Suddenly all the technology changes or what you do, the goals of what you have have changed. So as a result, you'll do different things. So for a enterprise, you've got demand, competition, laws, regulations, people, etc. And then you'll have your work processes, and then your outcomes are the products, the services, revenues, earnings, innovation, and it can even be that you have increased the uh, positive uh, way that people look at your organization. You may be, that might be one of the reasons why you do it, and the outcome might be that. So it's, it's very different. There's a lot of psychology involved in this, and it's not quite as direct as cause and effect. Sometimes you may do multiple things and as a result you'll achieve a specific outcome. Now, uh, as Tony knows, I've been with uh, Incozy since uh, 1999 and I've been very much involved in the defining of the languages, I'll show you in a second, mm -hmm. for about the last 20 years. I've been the chair of this one, the, the UAF, for uh, the last 16. So it's why I, I like it. Does anyone here know that the UAF is not the University of Alaska Fairbanks? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to that. If you Google UAF, that's the first one that comes up. So we, we got to figure out how to get up our numbers. But, but it's what's called the Unified Architecture Framework. 
and it's meant to actually express these. So we're looking at system architectures and system of systems. So you don't necessarily need to do the enterprise stuff, but it helps. But we're looking at needs, strategy, stakeholders, long-term plan. Okay, so there's different levels. I'll jump through them all so I don't have to keep turning around. Your strategic view, why are you doing anything? What is the purpose? What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? And why are you trying to achieve it? Your operational is can you define what you're trying to do in a solution independent way? For a lot of engineers, you tell them the requirements, they'll tell you the part numbers that you need to order. For systems engineers, you'll tell them a set of requirements and they'll say, well, let's look at these, do a trade-off analysis and figure out what is the best way to solve it within the given constraints. One of the exercises I do when I teach these courses is I tell people, okay, if you're gonna design a system for refueling a set of vehicles, and you need to keep track of how much you fuel to each, give, how much fuel you give to each vehicle, and uh, you need to do cost accounting, have uh, startup and shutdown procedures, et cetera, what did everybody just think of? A gas station, right? And then I say, except it needs to be up and running in 12 hours, and it's in a remote location with no power. And then suddenly you're thinking, oh dear, um, I'm going to have a completely different system. So you need to look at the environment, the constraints, the life cycle, how much time you have to get things up and running, and all the rest of it. And as part of the exercise, we actually come up with a set of capabilities, systems, and activities where you can use it for a flight refueling system, a gas station, or as I said, this ad hoc system. And that's what systems engineers do. They say, what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish? Once you express that, if you vary the constraints, the environment, and the rest of it, you can then do proper trade-off analysis based on what are you trying to accomplish, and you always have in your mind, what is the purpose? You're building this corner uh, gas station, and you realize actually it wasn't for just doing that. You wanted to do a whole bunch of other things, and you could be stuck with that. You get yourself too quickly to it. That's an important thing uh, to remember. Services for defining how do you express things as services, human factors or the personnel views, and how, what are my solutions? Also security, what are my risks? What are the cyber threats that I could uh, run into and how do I uh, mitigate those? How systems change over time and standards compliance. And then cross-cutting, you have data in all forms, the systems over time and traceability across. How do you go from my high level goes down to have I achieved my goals? And these are the different diagrams, and we'll look at some of them. And some definitions, that you, most of which I've explained. But we'll keep going. And you have different concepts and interactions between these. And there's 400 different uh, concepts here. Why? Because you're looking at, let's look at the world from a strategic point of view. Look at the world from a solution-independent point of view. Let's look at how we're going to do it. How do we provide security? Get the idea? So you need a larger vocabulary to express all the different concepts. So it's a big problem, and as a result, you need a large vocabulary. To okay, Austin Energy. I live in Austin, so it seems the one to do. Anybody know what a vertically integrated utility is? We have generation, we have distribution, we even have transmission in Austin. But do the generators send the electricity directly to the houses? No. Which, again, is sort of counterintuitive. What do they do? They send it to the transmission system. And they sell it to the energy wholesalers, who sell it back to Austin. Now, why do they do it this way? Well, what it means is that you have, as a result, if you lose one of your generators, you can buy electricity from someone else. If you have excess, you can sell that electricity to someone else. So there's constant interchange back and forth 
means that you have a much more stable grid. And if you have excess power or you are lacking power, you can quickly take care of it, assuming that you have planned for this. And that's part of what ERCOT does, make sure that there's enough generators that are capable of coming online. So you've got all these. And if you live in Austin, uh, every two years I have to buy, get a new contract. And there's like a list of 100 different generating companies based on a number of concepts. Generally, I go with green energy. All right, so when you're modeling these systems, the first thing you need is understanding. Uh, as I said, I do modeling of systems. And my rule is, is that it, it tell, tell my students, if you're drawing one of these diagrams for a specific audience and they don't understand it, you've done a bad job. It's not their fault. Your job is to communicate what you need to do in the proper way. And if you haven't done it, you did it wrong. Now, this is just simply, it's called the uh, general or the admiral's view, or possibly the CEO views, because we have ERCOT here managing the transmission center uh, system, the Texas government, which manages ERCOT, uh, the distribution center, which provides uh, is provided energy uh, from the transmission center. We have natural gas here, which is drilled and then eventually distributed. The wind powering our wind turbines. And at the center, we have our natural gas generator, which provides electricity. We have the steam for cooling. We have the natural gas, which sells power to the energy company, the gas wholesaler, uh, who also can provide it, depending on the size and the gas transportation network, et cetera. So gas needs water, gas, and it also needs distribution electricity. In other words, you can't generate electricity unless you have a which does seem counterintuitive as well. <laughs> Again, there's a lot of stuff involved in this that you look at it and you say, wait a minute, who set this up? So what you're trying to do then is to not jump straight to, okay, let's start defining all the full systems here. We're gonna say, what are my capabilities? I need to be able to transport electricity, provide water, provide customer gas, maintain the grid, generate green electricity, distribute it, provide governance for the whole thing, manage the grid. So I'm looking at what am I trying to accomplish? And then what I can do is map it to what are the systems that provide this? There's an intermediate step where I build a, a solution independent view, but we only have 45 minutes here, and I've only got 18 minutes left, so <laughs> I decided I'd skip a few. So what you're able to do is to say, okay, these are the systems, these are the capabilities, and part of what you're doing is to say, if I must provide all these capabilities, there's uh, mapping tables that tell you, well, actually, you forgot one of them. And I, as you see here, I have multiple ways of providing much of these. Generator, I've got natural gas, nuclear power, wind turbine. I, I left coal and uh, solar out, just to make the diagrams a little simpler. And then you say, okay, well, what do they interact with one another? What is involved in these systems? And again, this is where, again, the natural gas generator stands out because this has the largest number of dependencies of any of the systems that we have. Now, when I worked for Houston Lighting and Power, back in 1977, what was the main fuel we used for uh, electricity generation? Anyone want to take a stab? Coal. No, gas. You know why we switched to coal? Because Jimmy Carter said we're about to run out of natural gas, so everybody had to switch to coal because we had a lot of that. Now, isn't that the dumbest thing you ever heard of? But we did, and it cost us a lot of money. And yeah, everybody thought back then it was all coal. Well, natural gas was cheaper here in Texas at least back then. By price of oil production. There you go. So you could use it. And in fact, prior to actually figuring out what the gasoline could be used, when they were doing kerosene, they were actually throwing away gasoline. Isn't life bizarre? As I said. So anyway, it's now gas. Why? Because of fracking. So now it's much, much cheaper than and much more plentiful, as we're finding out. But you look at all the interconnections, and one of the things you do in risk management is there's two types. You say, what happens 
if I lose this system, this is what's called loss-driven uh, risk management. The other one is what are the possible risks that I have to this so that that way I can make sure that this system, these interfaces, uh, these interactions actually continue to take place. And so we'll stick with the risks for now and just say, well, what are our risks? Distribution failure, gas supply, lack of ROI is one of the big ones. And we can show all these different risks. Complicated, huh? You can generate tables for these as well. Makes it a lot easier to see. But it just shows you transmission failure, all those different systems are affected by that. Generator failure, all those systems. Nuclear natural gas generator, all the ones by there. Wholesale gas provider, just gas supply failure, and frozen equipment. Frozen connects, affects everything. Yeah? And the lack of ROI is affecting our infrastructure, in other words, the investment that we would do. So we had the big freeze. Uh, everybody stopped having their deer in the headlights look, and they said, we're going to pass a law, and we're going to mandate that all the uh, systems that were critical would need to be weatherized. That's it. You have to weatherize. Or else what? Nothing. You just have to weather us. <laughs> and they said, oh, thanks for telling us. And sort of went up their merry way. <laughs> what was worse, it was only the electrical parts. Remember all the other diagrams I've been showing you? Yeah. Okay. Again, they need more systems engineers in government. So we looked at this and said, well, there wasn't much business case for this. But later on, as you'll see, they actually did change this. And what they added after the, the bill came out was some penalties for not winterizing. I think it was a million dollars a day or something. And so how do we show weatherization? Well, remember I talked to you about the inputs and outputs of an enterprise. We have drivers, challenges, uh, opportunities, risks, effects, and outcomes. So the driver is, why are you doing anything? The challenge is something happened i.e. you're losing market share, that would be a challenge. Uh, an enterprise state is condition of the whole thing, i.e. we are or not generating. A capability we've already looked at, and an opportunity is something happens that allows you to actually take advantage of it. Everyone knows risks. An effect is a small thing that can happen, and an outcome is effectively what takes place. Those uh, effects that can take place. So we looked at this, and I created this model that says, what are all our drivers here? We have weather extremes, negative public perception, regulatory compliance now, which I spelled wrong, darn it, uh, built up expectation that when you flip the switch, your power comes on, and customer outages. What are our challenges? Now, this is Austin Energy, so we're going to want to reduce our carbon footprint, protect the infrastructure, and ensure availability. What are opportunities? Provide customers electricity when no one else is. Providing power during the cold season. Also green generation, load shedding, and winterizing your infrastructure. Because, of course, again, there's going to be funds for this. Then you can look at all the goals we have, map the drivers, the opportunities, <coughs> because the Austin Energy goals are we're going to provide continuous power, have a positive customer experience, make the grid more resilient, have environmental leadership, and be financially healthy. So what it does is it takes the opportunities, challenges that we have, and the drivers and say, what are the relationships between the goals that we have? We have some more simplified diagrams to show you just and then we took the winterization. So this little triangle here means that this is a type of this. So we have transport electricity, well, winterized transportation of electricity, providing gas generation, winterized providing generation gas, winterized fossil fuel generation, et cetera. So we've created these new systems, and we've created these new capabilities. And then we've said, over time, how are we going to roll this out? So we looked at 
what are the capabilities that we currently have, which we've already looked at, and what is our value stream? So you're able to, again, we're going back to the business rule. By generating electricity, what does the company get? It's money. Another thing that comes out of it is power, and what it provides to its customers is physical comfort, amongst other things. When it's winterized, what do you get? Reliability, confidence, and if it's green generation, you get public approval and a lower carbon footprint. And if you have the right uh, uh, stimulations or incentives, then you also get return on investment. Then you look at the effects. These are our desired power generation. This is our environmental emissions in terms of uh, megatons of uh, CO2, green power percentage, etc. And we're looking at all the different systems that we have here. And then these are the actual numbers that we ended up with. And this is more or less a perfect set of elements where our total capacity is 7,000. That's about the maximum. 70,000, sorry. Uh, total current generation is 50,000. We have an uh, active reserve of 10,000. We always like to keep more power generating in the system than you're actually using. And you'll also have a set on top of this, and you can have what's called spinning reserve. Generators keep on turning, even though they're not generating. What it means is that you can turn them on in almost any That way, if you have an emergency, you can do it. And it's one of the problems that you have with uh, windmills. You can't stand there and blow on them and make them go. It doesn't work, I've tried. They're too big. And so as a result, you have almost a, a sort of a sine wave like this of the gas of the uh, wind generation and with the uh, sun it's like this do you know what the the uh, the curve looks like for gas for power generation with gas or nuclear it's flat it's either on or it's off you can increase it and decrease it some but this is what the grid all the control equipment all the everything was built to it you know what the other problem we have people put the solar panels on the house the way that an electric gate is set to work, it's a big loop for the transmission, and the transmission goes around in a circle. Distribution, think of it as like the branches of a tree. So you have a substation, the electricity goes out, and then is delivered to the, the houses and the businesses. Do you know what direction it always goes from the substation to the house? Now we have solar panels on everybody's roof, the electricity is moving backwards, sometimes all the way up to the substation. None of this equipment is set to do that. There was an outage back in oh, 2003 or whatever it was on the East Coast. Remember that one? Oh, we're talking about that. Yeah. What happened is somebody installed a set of sensors backwards. They did, they did the polarity wrong on the sensor, and they were looking at the power going the wrong way, and they ignored it. They're running load flows that we're telling them, no, you've got a serious problem here. And they said, yeah, whatever. And <laughs> that's what caused it. I got, that's another whole paper. I wrote a paper on that one as well. But the point of this stuff is, is that when, if we're going to get a green generation system, it's not just adding in the green stuff. It's all the control systems. It's holding everything. Everything needs to be aware of it. And let me tell you, when you're grid is doing like this in terms of generation, it's really bad on the equipment. So again, we're going to have to figure out recompense people. Anyways, and then you've got your final actual outcomes, i.e. our customer satisfaction, shareholder value, overall resiliency. So these effects are all short-term. We're able to actually have these grid measures, winterization measures, and the outcome is the long-term customer satisfaction, affordability of electricity, resiliency of the grid. Get the idea? So you're building up the system, you're planning it, you're figuring out when am I going to roll these out, what are the capacities, so on and so forth. So you define what are the effects, what are the outcomes, what are you trying to accomplish. And as a result, if you pull all of this together, I did say I had a simplified version of this, but I only meant slightly simplified. <laughs> Our capability here is winterized fossil fuel generation, which 
is provided in our third phase, if you remember, and we have our winterized natural gas generation, which is giving us better health. Why? Because when we have uh, outages, we have less people affected and we have fewer deaths. Brings it all home. And then our total reserve is higher and our total load is able to go. Uh, our opportunity is providing this power. We have another one winterized. This is going to help these goals. What are our drivers that we have here that are caused by these protect uh, infrastructure and maintain continuity? Negative perception, customer outages. So you're trying to weigh all these different things together. What are my company goals? What are the challenges, the drivers? How do I map all these up? And you can actually mathematically model all these different things and you can figure out how do I get the best outcome overall. And again, here's another version with less text on the diagram and it's just using colors to show the difference. Where your drivers are on the right, your opportunities are on the left challenge. And again, you can do some stuff. Now, one of the things that I mentioned was you need to be able to explain these concepts in a way that people can understand it. And it's one of the things for my next paper that I'm doing, but th this one sort of uh, does it at least partially. So we have our electric generation, because they normally go down for the maintenance in the winter. Why? Well, everybody uses gas to generate heat, right? Yeah, not if you're in California, not for long. They're all going to switch to electricity. The great Babylon Bee headline, which is uh, a state that has no electricity mandates electric cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell that joke in Texas. I told it in California. I didn't get a lot of laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> but anyways, now people are now using a lot more electricity for this. So the problem is your less peak time when you can actually do the maintenance on these systems is not as long as it used to be. So your generator's down, the crisis happen, ERCOT starts raising the power price, eventually it gets high enough, you have a crisis averted and everyone is happy. So this is a simple simulation to represent this, where I have ERCOT here who's setting the price, there's my electric generator. This is the states, we are in a power crisis, and it's looping around with ERCOT raising the price and saying, is that enough? And the electric generator companies go, yeah, not quite so much, because it's going to cost them a certain amount of money to abort maintenance, and they have to look at how long they can run for, et cetera. And then eventually, as you'll see, the price gets high enough, it switches to up and running, and then we go from power prices to everything. Again, it's not just you must generate electricity, it's make it worth my while. Yeah, system systems. What actually happened? Gas was so expensive that the electricity could never, actually the price of electricity could never raise high enough. It was something like 2,000 times the cost of what it normally should have been. We, I had a, did a project, which is a whole other thing, in um, Australia, where they said theirs is, again, the deregulated market, and the price of electricity rose 20,000 times the normal price. And we're doing this project for a gas extraction, full steam gas. Incredible stuff. Anyways, as a result, they had a $2 million electric bill for one day. And so part of the project was to actually model their whole system. The other thing was, can we actually predict when this is going to happen so that we can do a graceful shutdown? or shift to other ways of actually generating electricity. That was an interesting one. Anyway, so as a result, you get uh, what you call a deadlock. There, uh, you will never actually get running. So you have ERCOT, the generator, and we've had the gas producer, and his price for gas, and we're going back and forth, and he's looking at the price for how much it's gonna cost. Anyway. The generator never turns on, and we remain happy. Now, what the government finally did at the end of the day is they said, we're going to give you money to have gas reserves on site. One of the best things about coal is, and the reason why we've used it for so many years, is the rule was you had to have three days of coal at your plant, so that that way if the 
supply of coal was interrupted, you could still maintain generating electricity for three days. So what they said was they were going to call, pay for the infrastructure for actually building this system. So we go back to where were we? Our risk is a gas supply failure, and it's going to affect the energy company, the gas transportation, and mostly our natural gas generator. We have what's called the security control, which says we're going to have gas-powered electricity. She'll store three days, excuse me, of gas on site. And we, it's made up of the uh, winterized generator and now our gas transportation network, because all the gas in the world doesn't help you if your generator's froze. And here's our emergency gas supply system with a natural gas driller providing this, of course a pressurization system, gas storage tank, a gas supply bypass, and of course the control system here. And all these systems together, it's sort of like, you know, if you have a battery on your house, lose power and it shifts over to the battery. So it's a system like this. So you look at how am I going to mitigate it, and this is the way to do it. And what caused us to do this? The fact that they actually gave us the money. In other words, they changed the which is, of course, what all this is about. So the thing everybody says is, okay, can you use these to solve the problem? Good God, no. But what I can do is use this to identify the problem, get solutions. And then remember I said that I, I worked with like 20 different, for an EMS system, energy management, 20 different programs. Use those. The problem with all those systems is they're all siloed. Talk together. But if you just look at one and you don't step back and say, what happens if we lose water? If you're a power generation company, it might not occur to you. But if you're a systems engineer and if you're looking at the whole enterprise, it's going to be first up there. So you're going to use this to say, let's step back, look at these systems. Look at it from a different point of view and figure out how we can do this because if you ever want to get the crap scared out of you, apologies for my language, uh, go to a critical infrastructure meeting because there's cyber attacks, uh, space weather, electromagnetic pulse, all sorts of stuff that means we're all going to be in the Stone Age when the sun is. <laughs> Let me tell you, you have a lot of whiskey after you go to one of those meetings. So, for the reason, <laughs> quantitative analysis. One of the things that is missing in what we have is when do you have conflicting goals? How do you model it? How do you model when you have multiple things in your company, in your system of systems that are working against one another in certain circumstances? Identifying those, recognizing, and figuring out how do you get them to work together. A more detailed risk and failure analysis. Many customers went bankrupt as a result of this. So again, if they had better risk analysis, it would have worked better. And come up with more stakeholder consumable views. Now, the abstract said I was going to mention the COBRA effect. Anyone know the COBRA effect? Yeah. Not me. No, no, it's a different one. Anyone here of Indian extraction? Okay. The In colonial India, there are a lot of people who are being killed by COBRA. So, the British government had a great idea. They said, we're going to pay whoever brings in the heads of cobras X number of rupees for each head of cobra. So what did the Indians do? They started raising cobras. Yeah. They bring in the heads of the cobras. And then somehow the British government found out and said, okay, we're not doing that anymore. And so what did those Indians do? They let them solve the cobra. Oh. And as a result, what happened? Well, you know what happened. Remember Wells Fargo? How do they incentivize their employees? Sell as many things as you can or else you'll be fired. So that was, boy, that was a terrible thing. And what did they do? All those phantom bank accounts people found out afterwards. Enron. I remember I was living in the UK and I came back and I was at a job fair or something. I'd been there while I was thinking of moving back. And they were telling me about how they were going to uh, deregulate the energy industry across the US and all the rest. And I said, I got to tell you, if I had a company, I could make all 
lot of money gaming that system. <laughs> and of course, that's what Enron did. It's, I think it's why I'm a good systems engineer. I'm really good at thinking easy. <laughs> and if you do safety critical systems, which I've done my whole career, you need to be have at least part of your evil. It gets you out so that that way when you go home, you're a sweetness and light, right, dear? <laughs> And then the wild boar in Arkansas, where the same exact thing happened with the cobras in India, where people across the border were raising wild boars, driving across the border with their wild boars, and then getting the uh, money from them. Okay. So, conclusion. Unlike Don Quixote, the windmills are not evil monsters. They're not the villains. Everybody contributes to this. And in fact, if we can get, in quotes, free electricity from the wind, why wouldn't we? One of the things we do have to look at is they take a hell of a lot of energy to build, and it takes, I think, up to 10 years to actually pay that back before you actually really are getting green. But we need to do this, and we need a diverse, reliable, and winterized array of generation sources. Everybody fails. Why did they fail? Lack of motivation, lack of incentives, everything froze, it was a systems of systems approach, and a lot of it was everybody knew it was eventually going to happen. No one planned for it. Texas legislature, they are not big on making people do what they don't want to do. So eventually they did, and this is why the year after we had the grid outage, it didn't happen except in El Paso, and we all left. <laughs> Just a little. Okay, so. And we need to look at the whole supply chain and the whole system of systems. And if we do this, this will ensure we'll stay warm on those cold techs, even though they are fairly infrequent. Oh, and I sell training courses. I, I teach this stuff, which is why I love this stuff. As I said, um, this has been my life. And here are some of the other uh, papers that me and my colleague have written. Uh, doing mission engineering with the UAF, where we've modeled the Battle of Hoth, which is called why it's called Darth Vader's real secret weapon. This is modeled from the point of view of the evil empire. I told you I get my evil out by doing modeling. Uh, also, uh, this was working at uh, hazard analysis on a system of systems. This was looking at truck platooning. We did a smart cities model that looked at nothing but system or people as a means of looking at the homeless problem. That one was fascinating. Uh, Model-based acquisition, which if you're in the government is a big thing. And the oil and gas paper I was talking about. It's, apparently there's a lot of oil and gas going on here. Uh, possibly something you might be interested in. So virtually or in person, let me know. My brother-in-law is always happy to see me on the other side. OK. And any questions? And I did go over my apologies. With your model analysis, are you have you considered using any kind of artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning to help improve your results? Big time. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. In fact, uh, there's an Incozy uh, conference which is going on, which is AI for systems engineering and systems engineering which is looking at this. And I've actually done a couple of jobs for uh, the government where we're looking at combining AI with people at agent-based systems. It involves you modeling everything as if it were neither a person or a system and defining what are you trying to accomplish so that that way if a system. So, yeah, it, it will help a lot. And predictive analysis especially. Tony. Tony's seen this already at least three times. <laughs> oh, you're too good to me, Tony. Um, I know you have another paper on this. Yeah, what, one of the things is training. Uh, what a lot of people, some training courses, they'll go through and it's how do you draw the pictures? 
which is basically teaching an architect how to draw a straight line, but not how to build a building. And what I do is I've been teaching this stuff now for roughly 25 years, and the system of systems stuff for the last 20. And what I do is, again, the exercise like with the, you need to provide gas or fuel, sorry, to a set of vehicles. And we say, okay, what are your capabilities that we need? How do you express as a solution? My starting point is to give them a problem and like pulling teeth, it answers out of them because my way of teaching it is how do you think in terms of this vocabulary? Does anyone remember the book 1984? You all do. Oh, yeah. Remember the section at the end on Newspeak? What does Newspeak do? The purpose was to limit your vocabulary. And as a result, it was to limit your ability to think and express ideas. So the example they give is all men are created equal. Equality is a bad thing because all the people above who are running everything who are in no way, shape, or form equal. So you get rid of the word equal and you change it for the word the same, which means you say all people are created the same. And you say, oh, there's men, women, there's that guy has. She has red hair, I have gray hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, it's meaningless, so you can't express the concept. Now, part of the purpose of all those views I was showing you was to limit your thinking. If you can only think in terms of solution-independent ways, you have to train your brain to do so. And once you've figured out what do I actually want to accomplish, you can then look at okay, here now is another set of vocabulary for how do you do it? Software interactions due to so it's at each level of that abstraction hierarchy I was talking about that you have to rethink what you've just done and figure out how do I go from I've got a great idea at different layers all the way down. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, what happens if the requirements change? High level, i.e., again. We've got a systems, we've built an infrastructure, and we've made it perfectly just for that set of requirements. And all we have is the implementation model, and someone says, we need to have a whole new capability. You have to examine the detailed stuff. You can't go back to first principles and say, okay, how do these different goals work together? And as a result, what is the impact all the way down? Or, I have this system. This one's cheaper. Can I use this instead? No. Change your impact analysis and change analysis. Heck of a lot easier. And it means that you can talk to people in terms of what are you trying to accomplish, and you're not immediately showing them how to wire up your system. Communicating with people at the level that they're able to and in the area in which they're interested and which they're going to resonate. And good people, when they're teaching you this, do that. I have the most annoying way of teaching, which is, if you don't tell me the answer, I'm not going to tell you. I make everybody, and these are virtual classes, so oh my God, is it painful. <laughs> go through, and they do the work. And sometimes I'll let them go off into a tangent, and I'll say, well, let's look at that. As a result, what have we now got? What are the problems that we've suddenly got? Because I always tell them, make your mistakes now. Find out what are all the possible mistakes you You don't want to do it on a project when your boss is looking at you going, are you an idiot? You want to do it now, where I'm going, that's okay. Here's how you fix it. The other thing I teach them is, don't be afraid to put the model. Because whatever you put in the model, it's wrong. And they sort of look at me like, well, that's not very helpful. And the reason is because until you put it down, until you say, this is what I think, you don't know it's wrong. Because somebody else will come in and say, ah, you forgot about this. It means you have to have a very good collaborative environment. I had a music teacher who gave me good advice. I used to play bassoon with the orchestra. And he said, if you're going to make a mistake, make it loud. Make it once. Commonly, you know, playing your bassoon there and no one can hear you. You're not really adding much to the music, really. And you could be playing all the wrong notes and no one would know. 
soon as you actually do that thing and you tell people, this is what I think, you can find out all the ways you're wrong. Because if you're a systems engineer, you're going to be wrong multiple times in a day. Any kind of systems engineer. What is engineering? It's correcting your misconceptions, mistakes, misunderstandings, miscommunications over a period of time so that you arrive at the right solution. But if you're not communicating and telling people what you think, Anyone know? So, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, I, I call it solving the blank sheet of paper based pro, uh, problem or the blank screen problem. You know all the notation, you just have no earthly idea. You know the alphabet, but you don't know. Very good. And I'm over time. My wife is pointing at her watch and saying, <laughs> If you want to learn humility, marry, marry a lovely Mexican lady. Yeah. <laughs> strong and independent. Right? <laughs> uh, any any more questions? But did everybody find this helpful? Okay. We uh, I like giving in person presentations. They're a lot more fun. And if you're not, if people are starting to look at their email and stuff. Then I know, okay, I need to speed up, get more interesting, mm -hmm. tell a few more jokes or whatever. Sorry, right, so I'll finish because I'm five minutes over. Thank you, Rati. Happy to have you. Mm -hmm. I've seen this the thir third time now. <laughs> and, and after your class, it's starting to sink in. <laughs> <laughs> See, he, Anthony's been on my course, so you know. So, Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much, whatever this is. May you never go without power. Ah! <laughs> I know what this is. <laughs> yep, it's a power pack. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, will, I will treasure that. Yes. So, do you, does your home have We do not. I'll tell you why. Because I actually ran all the numbers on them, and I realized, well, I'm 65. And I will be dead 20 years before it pays itself back. Part of the reason <laughs> because I keep my summer thermostat, and my wife will make a, a grumble complaint about this, at 81. And in the winter, I keep it at 69 because I like to be hot in the summer and cold in the winter. Again, if you grow up in Minnesota, you have to kind of you get used to that. So I don't mind. So. If, if someone sees me actually wearing shoes and I'm in Austin, they say, oh, who died? I mean, because <laughs> I'm in bare feet or sandals, shorts, and a T-shirt. So I, I ran all the numbers on I just couldn't make it work because it was just going to take too long. Plus, after we had all the hailstorms we had, I scratched my head and thought, mm -hmm. maybe if I were leasing. The other thing is, is for it to really work, you need a battery. Yep. You need a Tesla battery. You don't have the battery backup. There's no point in having one. I, I got a buddy who, uh, his wife is not as wonderful and understanding as my wife, and she keeps the temperature at 73 degrees year round. So, as a result, a month's power bill, I have 150. So uh, he said, yep, we're putting on solar panels. <laughs> His paid itself back in five years. <laughs> it was pure, what are my incentives? But would I like to have them and have the battery backup? Yeah. My brother-in-law has a gas generator. Over when we lose power, which we do now. And up in, uh, here in Houston and up in Texas, Austin. So as a result, uh, he was tired of being a power in a hurry. The problem is, again, if they decide to cut the gas or they raise the price of gas, uh, we're in trouble. The British have a great expression, it's all smooth and roundabout. <coughs> the whole of life, the whole of system. In service. Very 
biggest uh, cost is the Air Force, 70% of their budget, you know what it's on? Not the acquisition of this year. Anyone buy a printer? <laughs> Printers are cheap. <laughs> printer ain't? Yeah, not so much. <laughs> Yeah, 25 bucks for a printer, and oh, by the way, the cartridges are $25 each as well. Did, did that answer your question? Because I really wanted solar panels, but I just looked at it and I said, never going to pay for it, though. Kind of a numbers guy. Yeah. Yep, everybody enjoyed it? Did you all learn something? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. That, that is always the intent of this. And, to be a little bit entertaining, tell me. This is it. I'm in Texas, so I. <laughs> There's the old saying, which is never ask a man if he's from Texas. Why? If he is, he's going to tell you. <laughs> and if he's not, you don't want to make him feel bad. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> email you these slides. Okay. All right, so there's lots of different opportunities in the whoops. Uh, the next joint meeting is in the summer um good night, good night everybody. Let me contact me and Anthony Secretary Texas. Have a safe Drive back, Matthew. Oh, 